Just recently I got my hands once again on a number of used stick welders. Unlike modern welding inverters or even tick welding machines, these devices are not expensive at all and they are there in abundance. In my country, Germany, you can buy used stick welders for around 30 euros. They are rugged and simple since they mostly consist of a transformer and not much more. The next question would be then, are they any good? A quick answer would be, well, you can weld with them, but they will overheat after just a few minutes, since they are underbuilt and not suited for continuous operation. But I believe that I can test and demonstrate a number of relatively inexpensive do-it-yourself upgrades that will boost the performance of these simple machines. And make no mistake, even though I mostly use stick welding in my videos and know the comforts of MIG and have even dabbled in oxyfuel, I can assure you that good old stick welding or manual metal arc welding MMA is good enough to build awesome things. My exercise machine that I built around 10 years ago was made on the garage floor with a good old stick welder and for many of you it could be the cheapest way to enter this field. This video is all about improving these really simple and inexpensive devices and also show a path to even use them for TIG welding. For that we will first examine one of these welding machines and its performance. This welder is pretty typical for a cheap entry level machine you could buy in a hardware store here in Germany. It is based on a leakage transformer or stray field transformer, in German Streufeld Transformator. Sitting on that big screw is an adjustable magnetic shunt that can be pushed into and pulled out of the magnetic core of the welding transformer. Some time ago I made a video with detailed explanations of how this works. The video titled How Welding Transformers Work has been watched around 750,000 times by now and if you want to know more about the leakage transformer and the adjustable shunt, check out that video. It can be found in the video description below. Outside of the transformer's secondary winding, we find a temperature switch that will disconnect the primary from the mains when it reaches a certain temperature. It will later turn on again and you can continue welding. I have now inserted the temperature probe of this Fluke 87.5 DMM in a little space between some turns of the secondary winding. So without further ado, let's go over to one of the workbenches and do a welding test. How hot does it get and how quickly? How long until it switches off and how long do we have to wait until it kicks back into operation? And we start welding with the transformer at the current ambient temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. I weld at the maximum settings and as continuously as possible. After one minute we are approaching 50 degrees Celsius. After five minutes almost 125. And after less than eight minutes of continuous operation the transformer has reached 200 degrees Celsius and the temperature switch has disconnected the primary from the mains. Now I have to wait for the transformer to cool down. How long will it take? Well, I stood there waiting and it took 9 minutes. Now you may say, well, 8 minutes of welding and 9 minutes of waiting. That's not that bad. But consider this, until now we have welded with the transformer warming up all the way from ambient temperature. But if you want to continue welding now, it will start from over 100 degrees Celsius. So how long will this last if we keep on welding? Well, it turns out that the transformer will overheat again after 2 minutes 20 seconds. And then you'll have to wait for another 9 minutes of cooldown. So I repeated this process many times and plotted the temperature graph of my average findings. The machine takes 7 minutes 45 until the first shutdown. 9 minutes of cooldown follow and then you can weld roughly for 2 minutes 20 seconds and have to wait 9 minutes again. And this is the cycle at which you will be able to work from now on. For the core to cool down back to ambient will take more than 90 minutes. So here comes our first upgrade and it is really effective and simple too. Add a powerful fan to the enclosure that sucks the heat of the transformer blowing it out of the enclosure. In my example, I'm using an old server fan. So let's repeat the test.
both the initial welding time as well as the duty cycle have significantly improved. The initial welding time is longer, the cooldown is much shorter and the on time has also almost doubled. So let's visualize the working duty cycle here as well. And if you were to use the normal equation for the duty cycle as we use it in switch mode power supplies for example, we get a duty cycle of around 21%. While with a fan installed, we are able to prolong the on time and shortening the off time resulting in a real duty cycle of around 63%. I would call that a major improvement. Now to be fair, if you take a look at the nameplate of almost any welder that was sold here in Germany, you will find a percentage value for ED, which means Einschalt Dauer or on time. And as far as I know, it is defined a little differently than the general duty cycle formula that I used here. And from what I read, this value is supposed to mean the percentage of allowed welding time for a given time span of 10 minutes of work. But be that as it may, this graph shows you what is really going on here. On to the next upgrade then. As I mentioned before, many of the older welders use an adjustable magnetic shunt that is simply a block of transformer lamination and it is introduced into the core and will essentially weaken the inductive coupling of the primary and secondary by bypassing a portion of the field lines. As I said, I already explained it at length in an older video. One of the really annoying things about this method of decreasing the welding current though is that it might take you well over a minute to adjust the transformer from the highest to the lowest setting. It also doesn't allow us to regulate the current electronically. But I have decided to build an electronic circuit that will allow us to set the welding current with a simple potentiometer. I also want to remove the screw and the knob entirely in order to allow for better airflow around the transformer. You will see what I mean by that in a few minutes. Removing the shunt completely should be equivalent to running the transformer at the highest setting, because at that point the shunt is pulled out of the iron core entirely anyway. The circuit will work in conjunction with an Arduino Uno microcontroller. I implement the circuit as I often do on a piece of Vero board. A detailed explanation of the circuit and discussions of the source code will follow in a few minutes. But let us first focus on practical experiments here. Before actually performing a welding test, let me show you the amount of power that the circuit will actually have to handle. For that I have connected this power and power factor meter to the welding transformer. After switching on the transformer we can see the current and power values under no load. 8 amps of apparent current result in almost 2000 VA of apparent power, even when you don't weld. Compared to that only 150 watts of real power are converted into heat because of the resistive losses and core losses while 1800 VA or VAR are reactive power or Blindleistung as it's called in German. The transformer in its idle state presents an almost entirely inductive load with a terrible power factor of cosine phi equals 0.08. When welding at the maximum setting, in this case before the shunt was even removed, we read 27 amps of apparent current, resulting in around 5800 to 6000 VA of apparent power. About two thirds of that, 4000 watts, are real power. Overall, this reading far exceeds what normal German outlets are rated for. The rated maximum current of the circuit breakers is normally 16 amps, but you wouldn't believe how long they need to react if they are exceeded by a few amps as opposed to a dead short. In my welding tests here that sometimes took over an hour or more, the circuit breakers did not react. Should we be able to further improve the duty cycle of these welders though, it might be necessary to take measures for power factor correction to remove those 2000 VA or VAR of reactive power. At the moment I'm still waiting for the components for the power factor correction to arrive here, but you can expect to see that in the future. For now let's see if my circuit works. So here is our setup and I will start to weld at the maximum setting, then go over to the pot, adjust it down a bit and then weld again until we reach the lowest possible point.
So as you can see, I have succeeded in building a circuit that has just a few parts, but is able to handle the currents involved. And well, I was able to set the welder to various currents between 50 and 150 amps. More about the circuit though in a few minutes. What I can recommend to you at this point. If you want to get more out of your welder, add a fan and if you like, copy the circuit. From here on out, this video will get more experimental. The following upgrades are very interesting, but might exceed the effort that you might be willing to invest here. In order to allow for better airflow and to make room for additional electronic upgrades, I decided to build an entirely new experimental enclosure. I needed something really rugged and something that would also act like an air duct to possibly further improve the cooling and thus the duty cycle of the welding transformer and I wanted to build two setups. That's why I decided to cut this huge steel pipe in half. It would act as the base for the new enclosure. I also took some old road signs from the scrap, cut them into round shapes and used them as front and back panels to install two of those fans on. I now had not one but two of those powerful fans. But like many of the cheaper fans you will find, they are built for 12 volts DC and you would normally need a power supply for them. And since I'm trying to deepen and improve my understanding of phase angle control circuits at the moment, I built another circuit from scratch that will allow you to power low voltage DC loads directly from the mains. It is a thyristor based circuit and I actually also needed to build an inductor for it. Just like the other circuit, I will give a more detailed explanation in a few minutes. For now, let us test the circuit. As you can see, I'm able to power the two 12 volt fans in series directly from the 230 volt grid. In the new enclosure, the welding transformer is placed between the two fans and I want to find out the optimal position and start another welding test. An aluminium sheet is used to close the enclosure, essentially forming a duct of sorts. In this test I was able to weld even longer, but the effect was smaller than expected. Positioning the transformer quite close to the back fan that is sucking the air out of the enclosure worked best. The second fan can be used to cool the other power electronics that I will add here though. With the overheating problem mostly under control, I was wondering what needed to be done in order to use this transformer for TIG welding. A first step would be to find a rectifier and rectify the welding current for DC TIG. Now I'm sure many of you will now wonder why I'm not trying AC TIG, which is more expensive anyway and would be interesting for aluminium welding. Well, the answer might seem a little bit confusing, but realizing DC TIG from this point is easier. The way to AC TIG will actually be a longer one, but I'm working on that as well. For now, the big question in my mind was if I would be able to find a cheap bridge rectifier that would be able to handle the enormous welding currents. A typical part that you can find on eBay is this 200 amps module that you can get for around 20 bucks. I installed it on a big heatsink that I salvaged from a broken audio amp some time ago. The transformer's secondary was connected to the rectifier and I first tried this with stick welding. It worked just fine. For the TIG welding test, the leads need to be swapped. The ground clamp needs to be connected to the positive output. The lead leads to the TIG torch and this hose here leads to an argon cylinder standing inside the workshop. And now I tried TIG welding. Uh... 
Well, it does work, but there are several problems. The welds are not that great, and it kind of feels like pulsed TIG, which is used for thin sheets, not thick metal. And well, that might be because the welding current actually is pulsating and will probably have to be smoothed out. The second problem is that the circuit breaker cut off the welder after about one minute of operation. And that happened again and again. Why is that? Well, it becomes obvious when again measuring the welder's power intake when using the exact same setup, but with a TIG torch instead of a welding electrode. The transformer draws now an insane 35 amps of apparent current and after a minute the circuit breakers will end this little game. So in other words, the roadmap from here is to implement a form of power factor correction and remove the reactive power and also possibly smoothen the welding current. The cheap welding transformer we tested here in this video has also reached its limit where air cooling is no longer going to help. Instead, it is time to simply pick a better welding transformer from an equally cheap but higher quality used stick welder. In order to do these things, a second, better experimental setup is now under construction. But these and other upgrades will then hopefully be covered in a future video. For now, let me go into the details and deliver some explanations for my circuits. But let me try to explain how I used this rather simple circuit to control the welding current electronically. We start once again with the line in neutral with an alternating voltage of 230 volts at 50 Hz between them, as is usual in my country. One end of the transformer's primary is connected to one of the two. And of course, the transformer does not only consist of a primary winding, but also has an iron core and a secondary winding, and that is where the welding leads are connected. The other end of the primary is not connected to the mains directly, but is connected and disconnected periodically via a triac. In this case I used a 25 amps 800 volt triac, but will later upgrade this to a 40 amp triac like the BDA 41800 once it has arrived here. The triac also needs a protective snubber circuit. It consists of a capacitor and a power resistor. In order to trigger the triac, we need a driver that can deliver a certain amount of current. We also want to provide complete electric isolation between the Arduino and the mains. And for those two reasons, we will not connect the Arduino directly. We will only do so by means of an opto triac. And to be more specific, the integrated circuit MOC3021, which basically consists of an opto triac and an LED that is needed to trigger this triac by means of light. This IC provides electric isolation by optical means. The opto triac is now not directly connected to the main triac's gate, but only via an RC circuit. A very similar circuit can be found in the MOC 3021's datasheet. It is recommended when switching inductive loads, which we are clearly doing here. And on its input, the MOC3021 has an LED, so like other LEDs, it needs a current limiting resistor. Furthermore, a potentiometer is connected to one of the analog inputs of the Arduino board. In this case, I used pin A1. At this point, the Arduino has all it needs to trigger the triac and set a time delay that can be adjusted via that potentiometer but it has no way to synchronize with the mains voltage to operate a phase angle control circuit. It also has no power supply. That is why I added a small mains transformer to the circuit. The way I have drawn the iron core is a bit unusual, but I did that on purpose so that the different functional blocks of this diagram are easier to distinguish from one another. It comes with two identical secondaries, like many small print transformers do. The voltage of one of the secondaries is first rectified, then charged to an electrolytic capacitor and then stabilized with a standard 7805 5 volt voltage regulator. I haven't actually implemented that yet on this board, but I have done that already on this very similar board right here. You can also see here that it is not necessary of course to have the big Arduino Uno on a separate board that is then wired to the Vero board. You can just solder a small microcontroller or another development platform, something like the Arduino Nano directly to a board like you can see here. 
The voltage supplied at the second secondary is also rectified, but this time it is not charged to a capacitor. Instead I simply attach a trim part that is used as a voltage divider. Its tab is connected to another analog input of the Arduino, in this case A0. The trim part is adjusted so that the peak value is within the 5 volt range of the analog input. So in order to explain how the circuit actually operates, let me show you a few waveforms here. Now we have two axes here. Our first axis displays voltages in volt. And then we have a second axis and that is showing the phase angle phi in radians. And the maximum value that we need here is 2 pi radians and that would be the same as 360 degrees. In the middle of course pi, then pi half and one and a half pi. And on the voltage axis here we have also three different points. One would be zero volts and then because we're in Germany the positive peak value 230 times the square root of 2 for an ideal sine wave. And down here the negative peak minus 230 times the square root of 2. Now the positive peak of the sine wave is at pi half while the negative peak is at one and a half pi. Also draw these dotted lines here and now let's try to plot a sine wave on here with the zero crossing at pi rad. So that's roughly what it looks like. It's not a perfect sine wave but not easy to draw and well we can also mark our, well, ideally our peak values here. Now this is what the voltage roughly looks like that we find between the line and neutral when you just, you know, probe the voltage at the outlet. And um, you remember that we rectified one of the voltages at uh, one of the secondaries of that auxiliary transformer and what the waveform of the output voltage there looks like is something close to this. It's only in the positive because it's rectified via full wave rectification. But as you can see the amplitude or in this case also the peak values of that voltage are much lower and that's because well the secondary has a lower output voltage but then we also have a potentiometer there or a trim pot as a voltage divider and at the output or the tap of that trim pot we will have a peak um, value here of only 5 volts because this is determined to go to the analog input of the Arduino. And um, what the Arduino really is doing after we have programmed it uh, is to wait for a really low value at the analog input and once that event occurs, which would be here and here near the zero crossing, it is going to start a timer and that timer is going to wait until a certain point that is determined by the other potentiometer that, that we connected to the other analog input. And at a certain point it will then trigger the triag. And that is going to happen in both the positive and the negative half wave. So the voltage that will actually be present across the primary of the welding transformer will more look like this. It will not be the entire sine wave, but depending on the phase angle that we set there, for example, something that comes close to a triangle, but it doesn't have to look like that. For example, um, we could also set a different phase angle and then the shape of that waveform would look like this. So what this means is, if we change the setting of the potentiometer, the time that the Arduino waits until firing the triac will get shorter, which in turn means that the RMS value of the voltage across the primary of the transformer gets higher, and that means that the secondary current, the welding current, once the circuit is closed via the welding electrode, will also be higher. So in other words, by just turning a part, we set a timer, which will then set a triggering time, which translates into different RMS values for the welding current.
But how did I program the Arduino? What's the source code? Well, the first question is, what are our input and output quantities here? We first have the voltage grabbed from the little transformer that I used to determine the zero crossing time. That voltage will be captured in the variable V rectifier. Second and similar to that, I'm going to grab another analog value and that is the voltage at the tap of that potentiometer used to set the phase angle. It's called V potentiometer. And third, we will have a time delay or a trigger time that will count down until the triac is activated and I call that T trigger. Furthermore, we have an output pin here. I used pin 10 and that's why I also had to declare it as an output. Now an infinite loop starts in which the variable V rectifier receives the value of A0 and V potentiometer the value of A1. T trigger is then defined as the product of V potentiometer times a factor that here roughly equates to 6. Now the program asks if the value V rectifier is smaller than 5 which corresponds to just a few millivolts coming from the rectifier in this example. If that is the case, we are very close to the zero crossing point of the AC voltage. And that's why pin 10 is now pulled down, making sure that the triac is inactive. The timer starts and after the microcontroller has waited for that preset amount of time, pin 10 is pulled up and the triac is triggered. The triac is then deactivated at the end of each cycle while the current drops under a certain minimum value and the triggering occurs anew in the next cycle. The factor is 6000 over 1024 limits the maximum delay time within each cycle by the way because it just doesn't make sense to trigger the triac too late here since you will not be able to weld them. If you have another type of load you could go as high as almost 10 milliseconds of delay. By the way this code is rather basic and can be refined in many ways. But discussing microcontroller programming is just not my main focus here. But what about the circuit that I used to power those two 12 volt server fans directly from the mains? Well, the circuit is actually designed to drive brushed DC motors, but it works for other DC loads as well. Under certain circumstances, the voltage can be adjusted between around 0.2 and roughly 24 volts DC. In our practical example, I used this to power two 12 volt brushless motors that I had connected in series, which is not an ideal way to power these motors, but it does work. Our circuit is a thyristor based phase angle control circuit. It acts as an adjustable half wave rectifier. And when powering an inductive load, it is common practice to connect an anti parallel protection diode to the load as well. And in order to smooth out that output voltage, at least to a certain degree, a big electrolytic capacitor is added there as well. I started with a 3300 microfarad capacitor in the tests, but later installed 11,000 microfarads. But that capacitance can be increased depending on the type and the size of the load. You would have to find the correct values through experimentation. Certain measures are further needed to protect the thyristor. That involves an RC circuit called a snubber in parallel to the thyristor and an inductive component called a choke in series with the circuit. The choke will decrease the change rate of the current flowing through the circuit and thus through the thyristor. A value of around 200 microhenries of inductance is recommended. The choke also needs to be rated for a current larger than the rated load current of the circuit or otherwise it could go into saturation. Normally you could just buy a little toroidal choke like this one, but I did not have one at hand. So I decided to make a choke based on an ETD ferrite core. The needed cross section area or diameter of the wires is a function of the expected load current. For every three to four amps, you should calculate at least one square millimeter of cross section area. I also introduce an air gap into the core and use MS polymer adhesive to glue the two halves of the ETD core together. The air gap can be used to set the inductance of the choke and the air gap would also prevent the choke from going into magnetic saturation. It is then also common practice to add a class X2 capacitor to the input. Its job is to reduce the electric noise generated by the phase angle controller. 
The circuit might otherwise disturb or even disrupt other mains powered equipment in their correct operation. And a last protective measure that is also recommended is to add a little fuse. The current rating again depends on the load you want to power. This circuit should be able to deliver up to 250 watts of power. At that point the currents would be rather high though and the fuse choke and thyristor would have to be picked accordingly. Now this is a 40 amp thyristor and we need a driver stage to trigger its gate. That can be done with a mid-sized bipolar junction transistor. I use the BD140 because that is my standard transistor that I have on my shelves for this kind of voltage and current range. The thyristor's gate is connected to the transistor's collector via this RC circuit here. And the behavior of the transistor, i.e. at which phase angle is it going to trigger the thyristor, is determined by this bridge that mostly consists of a number of resistors and diodes of different types. The left portion is basically a half-wave rectifier constituted by the diode D3 and an adjustable voltage divider comprised of resistor R1 and the potentiometer P1. In this case I used a trim pot for that. This left-hand branch of the circuit will allow us to apply an adjustable pulsed DC voltage to the base of the PNP transistor. With the shape of the pulse being a rectified sine half wave of adjustable amplitude. The right branch of this bridge circuit is basically a voltage reference. It provides the emitter of the PMP transistor with a more or less fixed voltage. This is done by old fashioned Zener diode stabilization. In the circuit diagram you can see a 12 volt Zener diode. But on the actual board I used a 10 volt and a 2.7 volt Zener in series because I just had no 12 volt Zener at hand. The purpose of resistor R3 is to limit and set the current through the Zener diode and the transistor. R2 was introduced and set empirically to improve the performance of the circuit. A small electrolytic capacitor is also added to further stabilize the voltage at the emitter. So here is basically how the circuit works if you ignore all the other components for a second. The transistor will become conductive and trigger the thyristor via D3 and R3 when and only when a sufficiently high current flows through its base pin and that is only going to happen when the voltage at its base, which remember is a half sine wave, is dropping below a certain value lower than the fixed value at the emitter, which is stabilized by the Zener diode circuit. And yes, I said lower, because this is a PNP type transistor. The amplitude of the signal at the base can be adjusted with a pod, and thus the moment in time during each cycle of the mains voltage when the transistor will become conductive. Expressed in terms of phase angles rather than times, the pot sets the voltage value at the base, determining at which phase angle the thyristor will be triggered by means of the transistor. Returning to the actual circuit, a few more words about the components used. The minimum requirements for the transistor here are 40 volts and 0.8 amps. As long as those are met, any mid-sized PNP transistor will do. It doesn't have to be BD140. The minimum values for the thyristor should be 40 amps at 800 volts and it mustn't have a built-in anti-parallel diode. The value of the potentiometer can be varied depending on what is the wanted minimum voltage here. Other than that, maybe a general warning is required here. This is a mains powered circuit that can deliver low level DC but no electric isolation. In German keine galvanische Trennung. This means that there are many points in the circuit that would be dangerous to touch. If you want to be on the safe side, use a transformer based design instead. So guys, this was my video about stick welder upgrades. It was very hard to finish because there were simply so many different aspects to this project. It was really not easy to make, but my ideal for this channel is still to deliver a mixture of practical repair videos and more theoretical videos where you actually learn something. If you agree and want me to continue projects like this one, make sure to give this video a like. It is very important to set the future direction of this channel. If you want to help more actively in supporting this channel, consider making a donation via PayPal 
or become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash TPAI. Links for that are in the video description. See you soon.